It's been a little while since Paul Vaughn has been able to be with us in the lectureship, and we're very grateful that he is with his wife, Ricky. Paul is married to Ricky Chet back in 1973, and they primarily spent their life working in mission work or with small congregations to build them up over a period of 32 years. Presently, um, do you call yourself partially retired or retarded? I mean, re fully matter. retired. It doesn't matter. It depends on your perspective. I wonder if they can see me talking to the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Paul is currently working with the Ship's Bend Church of Christ, Centerville, Tennessee, and I think they do consider him partially retired. <laughs> We're glad to have him with us to speak on the subject, the fatal error on Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Brother Paul. Well, what a blessing it is for Rick and me to come back and be with you. It certainly is a delight. I appreciate Brother David and the good work he does in this congregation. And I am so thankful, I want to say this right off the bat, lest I be not appreciative, that we're staying with Gene and Joy Litke. They are nice folks. Amen. You could not ask for better people. But David, you didn't tell me that they required you to take a bath every day you're with them. We thought it'd be good for you. Well, I'll try. But they are awfully good folks, just teasing. I don't think we could have had better host and hostess. When we think about God, what does it mean to reject God? Well, we must love Him. Jesus said that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And if we do not love God, that's fatal error. It'll cost you your soul. And we think about Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life that no man cometh through the Father except by me. And if we try to go to heaven some other way, that's fatal error. For there's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. And when we take this book, the Bible, and we read the words. And we try to twist this in some direction that is not intended. Or we try to throw doubt upon this book. That's fatal error against the Holy Spirit. For the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20, Knowing this, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So when we read this book, we're looking at a product that the Holy Spirit inspired the writers. That is verbally, plenary inspired. Every word is there because the Lord wants us there. God wants it there. And if we twist it in a new way, it is fatal error. It is apostasy. When we think about apostasy, and we think what it means, that word itself is, is a word that, that, that to me is devastating. Because it means someone has lost their soul. Not only have they lost their soul, but they may lose the souls of those they have influence over. And we all have an influence. As a gospel preacher, I have an influence over the people I preach and teach to. As a husband, you would have an influence over your wife. As a wife, you'd have an influence over your husband. As parents, you'd have an influence over your children or grandchildren. So if one goes off, it could lead the other one off into apostasy. But when we think about apostasy, it is a, de a determined, deliberate rejection of Jesus Christ and his doctrine. We talk about the Christian age. 
For the Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter days some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. That's dangerous. Because that's where fatal error leads you. It will lead us away from God. It will lead a person away from God. It will lead a person to a place called hell. And it is real. So when we think about apostasy, when we think about fatal error, how do we identify these false teachers? Well, Jesus said here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but enter they are ravenous wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. In other words, whatever they say, whatever they do, take this and compare it. And if it doesn't muster up to this, they're false teachers, and thus advancing fatal error. Thus advancing their own cause. Thus leading people away from God. Well, we live in dangerous times. Now, I'm going to show you something that's scary. So don't anybody jump out of your seat. We live in very dangerous times. Now, when I was doing this, I saw that commercial on TV with the little baby that he had all this money and he got him a clown for his birthday. He says, I really didn't realize how creepy they were <laughs> until they got here. But... Today, we are living at a time when instead of preachers proclaiming the word of God, many churches have clowns entertaining the simple-minded. That's dangerous. For you see, this fella here, people laugh at, they joke with, and he could take them away from God into fatal error. Biblical warning. Sugar-coated preaching is dangerous to the soul. There are too many preachers today who are willing to speak too softly when it comes to proclaiming the word of God. Paul said, preach the word. To be instant in season, or ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, they have itching ears. They will heap to themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth. Fatal error. This is how much important this lectureship is. So that we can put down in paper, in book form, lessons that deal with fatal error, so that we cannot speak softly but boldly against error. So that we can proclaim the truth. And there is only one truth. It is God's truth. Sanctify them by thy word. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Well in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. And this is the passages that David has assigned me. And turn your Bibles there. And I know you can quote it. And you preachers you can quote it. But turn anyway. You know at one time we used to be Bible toting, Bible quoting preachers. But we've got out of the idea to open the Bible and just reading the thing. We need to do it. Teaching a class once, and I told them to turn to the book of Genesis, and I had to look at an index. Now, that's bad. If you're, if you're looking for Genesis, and you have to look in the index. So we need to know our Bibles. In Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 38, And Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and for your children, for all who are afar off, as many as the Lord will call. Now Paul defines calling as proclaiming of the gospel. 2 Thessalonians in chapter 2 verse 14. That's not part of this lesson, but I thought I'd throw it in. That we're all called through the gospel. Well, it should not surprise anyone. Notice this. It should not surprise anyone that the enemies of the Lord and his church would use Acts 2.38 and verse 39 as fertile grounds to teach error. The beginning of the church. The plan of salvation. And when you think about the whole lesson in Acts chapter 2. When 
Peter preached the lesson that comes down to the conclusion. They says, man, brethren, what should we do? And he says, repent and be baptized in every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Where else could they go to find the answer? As some do today. Some think, well, now I just go over here at John 3.16. You, you know, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John wasn't written then, was it? Of course, that's fatal error. That's twisting the scriptures to your own destruction. But for them to be saved, what did they have to do? They had to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, for the forgiveness of sins. Then they have the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, with this in mind, we need to remember that there will always be false teachers. Love, believe not every teacher, but test teachers whether it be of God or not. And then in John, or in first, uh, Second Timothy chapter 2, preach the word as we read there. Proclaim the word. And then in Second John, verse 9, whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. So we have the pattern set for us given by the Holy Spirit as he inspired the writers of the New Testament and all the Bible, but particularly we're looking at New Testament tonight, New Testament verse. And then we just simply take him at his word and test other people, see if they're teaching this word of God. Now, baptism. Sadly, men have discarded baptism as being, uh, as being, as, Excuse me, sadly men have, have discarded baptism as being important to the salvation of men. Now that is fatal error. When you think about all the verses in the Bible, and we're going to read some here in a second, and how much emphasis God put on baptism... And then some Yahoo gets up and says, Oh, no, that's not important. Don't, don't let the Bible get in your way. Listen to me. That's not important. That's what they say. Well, the majority of the religious world classifies baptism as an insignificant issue. It's not important to them. It's an afterthought, something that's put forth. Well, it is a command of Jesus. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, 16, going to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Command of Jesus. When Mark wrote that down, was he inspired? Yep, yep, bear some heads, heads or something. He was inspired, wasn't he? Who, who inspired him to write that? The Holy Spirit. So is that not fatal error against the Holy Spirit to say that Mark didn't know what he was saying and Jesus didn't know what he was saying? When those commands were given, we're going to be getting into, there's going to be some good lessons on the men have really got some good lessons on the Holy Spirit and all the error being taught about it. But I want to introduce this right here. Anytime someone takes a plain, simple command from God, inspired by the Holy Spirit for Mark to write it, and they say, no, that's not what it says, that's fatal error. That's turning against what God intended for man to do to be saved. It is the only way into Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, For many have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Now do you think the devil has a victory every time he tells people that they don't need to be baptized? Because to have Christ, according to what the Bible says, you have to be baptized. That you don't have Christ until you are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Was Paul inspired when he wrote those words? Yes. He was an inspired apostle writing down the words that the Lord had given him that he was inspired by the Holy Spirit and to reject that is fatal error against God, against Jesus, and against the Holy Spirit. That's fatal error. 
because one will lose their soul in doing that. It is a work of God. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Colossians. In Colossians, in chapter 2, and verse 12, he says, Buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the, uh, faith in the working of God, who, excuse me, who raised him from the dead. Now, there are those in the religious world who says baptism is a work, and works can't save you. That is a work. Did not Paul just teach us that it is a work? But it's a work of God and not a work of man. And if someone denies baptism, twisting the scriptures is fatal error. It is the only way to wash away sins. Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Was Luke inspired when he wrote it? Yes. And it's fatal error to teach anything different. People will lose their souls. It is the only way to be in God's family, the church, because in Acts chapter 2, when Peter gave them the conclusion to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, those who responded were added to the family of God. So when we think about baptism and how important it is, and all the error being taught on baptism, that it's not important. Can't even be in the family of God without it because he adds us. It is the mean God uses to save. There is an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. And the type being he was talking about there, uh, the flood and Noah's day, how Noah and his family were saved through water. There's an antitype which now saves us, baptism. Baptism saves. So if anyone tells you that baptism doesn't save, that's a fatal error. That's coming from an apostate. That's coming from someone that either does not know God's word or has deliberately turned their eyes, their ears, and their heart from obeying God. And these verses here, they're not all that difficult to understand, are they? Absolutely not. You could take a seventh grader and he could read those and give you the meanings of those passages. Well, let's look at baptism. It is essential because it is an indispensable part of becoming a Christian. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Well, somehow people use Acts chapter 2 and verse 38 and they try to justify infant baptism. I like that little cartoon up there that whatever he is, tried to sprinkle a little water on that, on that baby. And, 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 and then I think of this. Little baby said, don't baptize me, I'm an atheist. <laughs> you know. That little baby doesn't know anything about God. And I think about those who try to advance infant baptism by taking the scripture out of context. And I think of John Smith. I know, David, you know this illustration. That he was there, at a, there was a watering hole, they were baptizing people, a denominational preacher, and they were baptizing people. Some woman brought a, a, a little baby, and that baby was a squalling and a kicking and a crying, and that old preacher baptized him. And John Smith got an idea, I'll just see about this. And he went out there and grabbed that old preacher and said, I'm going to baptize you. And he says, no, you're not. And he says, yes, I am. He says, but I don't want to get baptized. I don't care. I'm going to baptize you. Well, don't you know if I don't want to get baptized, it doesn't do any good? He says, that baby you just baptized didn't want to get baptized. Didn't do any good. Brethren, babies are pure in the eyes of God. And why do some religious groups baptize babies and thus advance fatal error? Because when that young baby grows to adulthood, it thinks it's saved because his mama and his daddy took him somewhere and they sprinkled a little water on his head. And you know that's not baptism anyway. It's not baptism anyway. 
it is a false teaching that babies are born sinners. It comes from Calvinism. That babies are born sinners. The scriptures teach that babies are pure in the sight of God. And I'm so glad to see the, 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 the young babies here. There's some babies, a couple sitting over here, and, and, and they're probably, and some, there's some children that are not quite babies, but they're still infants, or are still young, young children. And there's nothing more pure in any congregation than having babies. And then every once in a while, the mamas, you know, as a preacher, they come up to you, oh, I'm sorry, the baby was crying and I couldn't get it stopped. Well, about 90% of the time, or 95% of the time, I don't pay attention to that. And I said, well, I didn't know it. I said, it's when they get to be 16 or 17, they're playing in the aisle. That's what bothers me, <laughs> you know. Well, that's a different story altogether. And believe it or not, that happened once. I was preaching somewhere, and these kids were up in the aisle playing. Well, I tried to get a little louder, and they played a little louder, so I just sat down. I said, when you all get done playing, I'll start preaching again. They didn't invite me back anymore. I don't know why, but they didn't. Well, babies are pure in the sight of God. Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Now, if babies were born sinners... Is Jesus saying, let the little sinners come to me because that's what's in the kingdom? No. He's saying, we're going to have to be like little babies. Have our sins washed away. Have our sins washed away by the blood of Christ. Now, does it mean that children uh, do not sin as they grow to maturity? No. No. God does not impute sin to them until they are able to know right from wrong. He that knoweth do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. Now, before I started preaching, I managed a discount store for 10 years. And uh, I enjoyed that. I didn't quit it because I didn't like it. I quit it because I wanted to be a preacher. And I was there in front of the store one day, and this mama come through. She had a couple kids. And, and you know how children are in a store. And... You know, I'm sure you realize that we put, they put stuff on the shelf so it's going to entice you to pick up something. And in this store, now this was 35, 40 years ago. Just to tell you, when you check out that little bit of candy or gum, and back then Wrigley's gum was like 10 cents a pack, we had a chain of about 30 stores, and in that 30 stores from that 10 cents a pack at the register, they sold $3 million worth. And that's about a little over a million and a half profit just from that 10 cent pack. Well, you put that out there so people pick it up. Well, this mama come through, and this little child, three and a half, four years old, just barely toddling along, he saw a piece of candy. He reached down and grabbed it, opened it up, and ate it. That's stealing, isn't it? Yes. Did he know it was stealing? No, it just, he just knew that, that we did a good job in displaying something he had to have. And he took a, took a hold of it. And the mama didn't realize it, and I didn't say nothing. Uh, you know, some things like that's just best to turn your eyes the other way. Bar candy I can pay for, and the, and the store's not going to lose any money. She come back in, she says, oh, he's told this, and we didn't mean it. She didn't mean it. And I said, I know that. I said, but use it as a teaching thing, a teaching that that is wrong before he gets too old. Oh, babies and little children are pure in the eyes of God. And anyone who says they are sinners, that's fatal error. That is fatal error against God the Father, against God the Son, and against God the Holy Spirit. Because nowhere is that in the Bible. Nowhere is that in the Bible. Now I want to talk about, I'm getting off subject a little bit, David. But I feel like I just had to do it. Baby dedication. One of the dangers of infant baptism is the trend of infant or baby dedication in some churches of Christ. And I, and I heard this, you know. Parents bring in their infant to be dedicated. Well, 
The same argument that rejects infant baptism would also show that infant dedication is just as sinful. It really is. There is no biblical authority for it. And whatever you do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they say, well, what does it hurt? There's no warrant for it in here. That's what it hurts. There's no example or command for it in here. That's what it hurts. And they said, well, the little boys were circumcised in the Old Testament. Now, if they tell you that, they don't know much Bible at all because we know that that Old Testament law and teaching was nailed to the cross, don't we? So it's opportunity to teach the truth. But those who teach that babies need to be baptized, that's fatal error. Well, it's extremely dangerous to the soul to cross the line from truth because it becomes fatal to the soul. It becomes fatal to our souls. Well, there will always be wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware of false teachers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. There will always be that. And it seems as though we got more than our share today. But there will always be faithful gospel preachers. All oh, might be in the minority, but if you're faithfully serving God, you're in the majority <laughs> and pleasing to God. There will always be devils behind some preachers. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And there will always be the devil influencing some people, some preachers. When we left uh, Virginia and to come to Tennessee, and I told the brethren there that they're going to have time finding someone. And I said, just be prepared for it. <clears throat> they had a call from this preacher out in Missouri, and I don't know who he is. I just knew he was in Missouri, and he wanted the job, and of course they talked to him a little bit, and seen what he believed and what he didn't believe, and some of the men says, that boy doesn't believe in baptism for the remission of sins. And so they just asked him plainly, do you believe the person has to be baptized for remission of sins? He goes, no, so we don't need you. <laughs> we don't want you. There will always be those type of preachers. There will always be those who look to men instead of looking to God and His Word. And now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Brethren, the very best gospel preacher, and mark my word on it, the very best gospel preacher is nothing more than a messenger boy. It's not his message. And if he gets away from that message, then it's fatal error. It's fatal error. Well, watch me ape the Christian church. I just could not resist this. I had a debate with a Christian church preacher when we were in Ohio and and uh, during the debate, we agreed upon that there were some questions, true and false questions, we could present each night. And, and the first night, I presented him the question, Does one, uh, must one be baptized for the remission of sins to be saved? Well, he put a big T, true, on there. Well, I know he didn't mean that. Because just two days before the debate started, Rick and I were walking, as we do, as we did back then, and just have our evening walk, and I found a piece of paper along the road, and lo and behold, it was the bulletin from that guy's church. And it was Easter weekend, and that he was going to be preaching for the Nazarene church, and that the Methodist church preacher was going to be filling their pulpit. And I asked him, and I said, now, Dennis... This question here, you said that one must be baptized for the remission of sins, and you marked truth. Do you believe that? And he goes, yes. And I said, well, Dennis, when you went to the Nazarene church last Sunday, 
Did you tell them they were sinners and lost? Because Nazarene, they do not baptize for remission of sins. They have a prayer altar. And then he got all huffed up and mad and said, well, if they just call on the name of Jesus, that's all that matters to me. You know. And yet some of our brethren want to be involved with people like that. And that is fatal error. Reject baptism for the remission of sin. That is a charge directly against Luke, directly against the Holy Spirit, directly against Jesus, directly against God the Father. Fatal error. Fatal error. The abs they absolutely ignore the plain teaching of God, His inspired Word. And to reject the plain teaching of God is fatal error, period. Well, beware of false teaching. It is like a landmine. Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that abides in the doctrine of Christ is both the Father and the Son. I know you all know that passage. But the dangerous part is we're living at a time when very few understand what the doctrine of Christ is. Because instead of being taught Bible in the Bible classes, they're being taught how to live without offending someone. They're being taught how to be politically correct. They're being taught how to please men. And that's fatal error. We must be aware of that. Well, presumptuous sin. And if you think about fatal error, you'd have the root in presumptuous sin. Now, presumptuous sin basically is presuming that we're going to say something is right and God is going to accept what we assume. Now, just, maybe that's just the simplest definition. I'm just no country boy and that's the way I look at it. Well, keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Psalm 1913. When I first started preaching, I was so afraid, and still am, so afraid that I would assume something I taught was right, and it wasn't a thus saith the Lord. Now, I'm not above making a mistake, but I'm going to do everything I can that when I say it's going to be a thus saith the Lord, it's Bible. It's Bible. Anytime I preach, if I'm preaching 30 minutes, I want 30 verses. If I could possibly can, work more in. I've been places where one guy spoke 45 minutes and only alluded to one verse once. He didn't read it, didn't quote it, he just alluded to it. And I felt like I was robbed. Because that's fatal error to take God's time. That's supposed to be to worship Him and give a feel-good talk about ourselves. It is taking liberties with God's word. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 6, do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Don't do it, he says. You will be found a liar. We know where liars go. That's fatal error. There is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof is, is death. Proverbs 16, 25. Fatal error. I noticed David defined fatal error. And David, first time I heard the term fatal error, you spoke on it many years ago, or you mentioned it at the lectureship in Bellevue. And I thought to myself, what a wonderful way to say it. Oh, yeah, someone could be wrong. You know, and it's a matter of opinion, it's not going to hurt one way or another. You know, like Nicodemus. Some say Nicodemus came to the Lord at night because he wanted a private audience. Some say Nicodemus come to the Lord at night because he's afraid. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. The Bible doesn't describe. It's just all a matter of opinion. And I don't worry about things like that. Well, well, if, if David says, well, I believe he wanted a better, uh, better uh, time and quiet time with the Lord. And another preacher says, well, he might have been a little afraid. 
Well, as long as they don't count that as a matter of fellowship, saying you're going to go to hell if you don't see it my way, that's not fatal error. If I'm wrong, correct me, David. I know that you do that anyway. That's not fatal error. But any time we presume to speak where this does not speak, that is fatal error. And that will cost us our souls and anyone we teach that believe it. And if you don't believe me, you ever see that Joel Osteen on TV? If a piece of scripture come out of his mouth, his teeth would fall out. But boy, he's so happy and he's smiling and everybody's there, thousands of people, and, 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 and he's just going on and on and on. And they leave feeling good, but they don't believe being good. Because the only way to be good is to hear this, and anything else is fatal error. We must stand for God's word and proclaim it and not speak too softly, period. It is presumptuous to teach that babies need baptism. We talked about that. It is presumptuous to teach that baptism is not for the remission of sins. That's fatal error. Well, Jude said... Beloved, when I give all diligence to write it to you of our common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith. With that in mind, is there anyone that would say we should not earnestly contend for the faith? Is there anyone that would say that we should not stand up boldly for the faith? Because once we don't, that's fatal error. <laughs> well, is it fatal error to quit before time? <laughs> well, I was taught to get up, speak up, and shut up. <laughs> what do you want to say? It's your turn, Dub. Thank you. We'll just take that speech a little bit time off of your time. We appreciate that message. I, I don't know how many times he said fatal error, but he made it very clear. And I think right at the end of it, he did a good job of saying you can be wrong about some things, and it is not fatal in the sense that it kills you spiritually. And yet he showed all the other things that really if you go against what God commanded you to do in order to be saved, then you have sinned fatally. That is, you have just sinned. That's error that caused you to sin. I'd like for us to keep in mind all time, wherever we are, that sin is the only thing that can separate anyone from God. It's the only thing there is. It doesn't make any difference what you like about somebody or don't like about somebody or what they look like or don't look like, if it's not transgressing God's law, then it's not going to separate them from God. Jesus came. He came to make forgiveness of sins a reality. And he did. And in the gospel, the power of God to save us, Romans 1.16, then he has given us the way to be saved from our sins, to be reconciled to God. Let us resolve to be better students of God's word as we ask ourselves the question as honestly and objectively as we can. What do I understand about right and dividing the word truth and ascertaining the authority of God from the words of the Bible that I can be so very sure that I have not involved myself in fatal error? And that means I've got to know how the Bible authorizes what I must do in all honesty to understand it. And then, no matter the sacrifice to myself, be sure I fully obey God's will. We appreciate your work, Brother Paul, having you with us, and Ricky.
We're thankful for everybody's presence here. We have another to be brought to you in just a few minutes. We'll take about five minutes now and come back in at 8 o'clock for our next session. Thank you very much.